bare metal stent versus drug eluting stents in acute myocardial infarction. So in the next 12 minutes, I'm hoping to uh, try to summarize for you some of the literature and data that we understand with respect to bare metal stenting and drug eluting stenting and where we've been and hopefully where we're going. I have no conflicts of interest with respect to this discussion. So as the prior uh, uh, two talks have uh, mentioned, clearly the pathophysiology of our acute myocardial infarctions is a ruptured plaque with luminal intraluminal occlusive thrombus. And we've done a very nice job in the last few talks have discussed some of the pharmacology and the techniques and technologies we utilize to remove thrombus. And clearly at the end, what we want to do is provide a nice open lumen. And the stents are really what have allowed us to do that. They've allowed a mechanical scaffolding, gives us a nice circular lumen usually, and have really prevented vessel closure and, and, and some late restenosis. So just to go back in the days prior to our stents, what, what did we do and what were the data between plain old balloon angioplasty versus just bare metal stents? Let's start with that. This was 13 randomized controlled trials published, uh, uh, you know, in the last five or six years, looking at both 30-day and 6 to 12-month, both mortality, reinfarction, and target vessel revascularization. And although it did not change very much with respect to mortality and reinfarction, clearly we had less abrupt closure and much better long-term TVR rates with stenting. And that's where the primary STEMI focus with stenting came about. But what we did realize early on is just like with any other PCI, bare metal stenting had the Achilles heel of restenosis. So enter the era of drug eluting stents, which really changed our therapy for a stable coronary disease. And with respect to drug eluting stenting and acute myocardial infarction, I've put all four of the a larger randomized trials on this particular slide, looking at their binary angiographic restenosis. And clearly, as we knew with all prior subsets, we made a big difference with reduction in restenosis using drug eluting stents. And as Dr. Stone mentioned in his uh, talk yesterday, drug eluting stents have really revolutionized what we do, but clearly have some Achilles heels as well. Clearly, there has been issues with inflammation and late stent thrombosis with respect to incomplete apposition, abnormal vasomotion, and our thoughts on stent thrombosis, as been mentioned in the last two uh, talks this morning, are an issue when it comes to our STEMI and acute MI populations. So what are the potential problems? And they were well delineated. Clearly, there's impairment of reindustrialization and inducement of tissue factor, which is also prothrombogenic. And the impairment of endothelial function does also uh, add to the milieu of prothrombogenicity. The polymer also is an issue. But as the last speaker mentioned, the procedure itself in the setting of acute myocardial infarction is very different. There's oftentimes an undersizing and underexpansion of stents. Oftentimes, you don't know the exact full extent of disease. Dissections are often let, left behind. And stent malapposition is now a real phenomenon that we are starting to understand. And finally, when we meet these patients for the first time on the cath table with an acute coronary syndrome, we don't know them very well. We don't really know what their backgrounds are. And their adherence to dual antiplatelet therapy is often nebulous. So in deciding whether you're going to implant a bare metal stent or a drug eluting stent, many things go into the consideration, compliance, what about stent thrombosis, what's their restenosis risk, what's their bleeding risk, do they have any impending surgery, and who is going to follow these patients long term? Well, what we have learned over the last five, six years is that there's certainly a known phenomenon of delayed arterial healing at the culprit sites in drug eluding stent placement when we look at acute myocardial infarction lesions versus our stable lesions. And clearly, that's something that we've noticed. And if you look at this, what often happens, as was mentioned eloquently in the last talk, during acute myocardial infarctions, you put in a stent, uh, there is some lysis, and there's often late malapposition that we see, which can be a harbinger, many people feel, of future late stent thrombosis, which often does not occur in the bare metal stent patient. Now, this is somewhat debatable, but I think that it is an important phenomenon with respect to the procedure 
when we do these cases in our acute coronary syndrome patients. If you look at the Spanish Estrafa registry with 2,300, 500 patients, of which nearly uh, uh, several thousand, 2,652 patients, or 11% were primary PCIs. If you look at the stent thrombosis data for this primary PCI group, the STEMI population was nearly 4.2%. And if you look at the multivariate predictors of stent thrombosis, looking at early, clearly things that we have always known, diabetes, renal insufficiency are there, but STEMI is also there with respect to early. But what's more difficult and vexing is the late stent thrombosis, which is something that we often don't control, procedure-related, and STEMI also is a multivariate predictor for stent thrombosis in these late stent thrombosis cases. So what about dual antiplatelet therapies and meeting these patients for the first time? What are the predictors for stopping thyronepyridines early? It's very interesting. The most important thing that you learn is that nearly 14% of all of our patients that present as acute myocardial infarction, no matter how hard we try, are going to discontinue their thyronepyridines early. And, you know, things like not having a, edu a higher education, cost avoidance, discharge instructions play very heavily into whether these patients are going to continue their dual antiplatelet therapy or not. Clearly, Dr. Stone's uh, Horizons AMI trial has given us a lot of information with respect to DES versus BMS being the largest randomized STEMI trial done to date. 3,602 patients with STEMI randomized to bivalirudin, unfractionated heparin, and then subsequently randomized to bare metal stenting versus the taxis drug eluting stent. And if you look at that data, three-year composite safety endpoints, endpoints, both the MACE, mortality, reinfarction, are no different, if not better. Clearly, we do much better with respect to revascularization and restenosis with our drug eluting stent counterparts. And if, subsequently, if you look at Brar's publication, looking at all meta-analysis, and now a future 2011 publication looking at all meta-analysis of drug eluting stents, if you look at the mortality, although not statistically different, uh, tends to favor drug eluting stents. Look at myocardial infarction, again, not statistically advantageous, but in the favor of drug eluting stents, but clearly a marked reduction of 56% with respect to target vessel revascularization in the patients who have received the drug eluting stent versus the bare metal stent. And how about the safety? Again, although no statistical difference, um, clearly on unity, favoring slightly the bare metal stent, but not very different with respect to that. So the 2011 ACCAHA Sky Guidelines, looking at STEMI, first of all, it's a 1A for PCI and STEMI and, and 1C for unstable on, engine and non-STEMI. DES is useful as an alternative to bare metal stenting to reduce the risk of restenosis in cases in which the risk of restenosis is increased and the patient is likely to be able to tolerate and comply with prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy. So who do we and should we use a drug eluting stent? Clearly the benefit of the drug eluting stent is related to the baseline risk. The higher the risk of restenosis, the better the patient is going to do with a drug eluting stent. As long as you know that they're going to be compliant, depending on the other clinical and angiographic variables that you end up seeing. If you look at Dr. Stone's analysis in Jack of two years ago, looking at the multivariate predictors of 12-month ischemic TLR among patients randomized to BMS, patients with insulin-dependent diabetes, smaller vessels, and long lesion lengths are the ones that have, as we know, the higher restenosis rates. And I can tell you for the Indian subcontinent and the patients that you treat here in the cath labs that you, you are taking care of, these are the, often the patients that we're seeing in with the acute coronary syndromes. And so drug eluting stents probably make sense as long as patients are going to be compliant and can afford them. When are you going to use a bare metal stent for the STEMI population? Clearly difficult anatomy. Keeping it simple is usually the uh, choice for procedures. Diffuse disease, especially in our diabetics where you have stem to stern disease, spot stenting in a STEMI probably makes sense because you want to avoid full metal jackets. If you have large, unremitting residual thrombotic burden, as per the last talk, perhaps this is a case where bare metal stenting, at least acutely, will get you out of the woods, especially with unpredictable compliance. 
And if you have very large vessels, I think that bare metal stents are not unreasonable in these populations, especially with focal stenosis. And clearly, the very elderly populations or populations with higher bleeding risks are not unreasonable for bare metal stents. So to conclude early, the use of stents in STEMI reduces the rates of recurrent events related to restenosis, as we know. However, the rate of these events is among the lowest of any lesion subset. However, the rates of thrombotic events in the STEMI are among the highest observed in PCI. And so we have to really uh, balance these risks. And the choice of stent in STEMI needs to weigh the absolute differences in both restenosis versus potential thrombotic risks. Thank you very much.